was the thing I did last. Okay. And uh, we'll do the intro. Share screen. Good morning, everybody. We will start at eight o'clock, which is in one minute. Um, I want to welcome you to our final Echo Voices of the of the year, and we're really excited to have Kelly Foner back with us today um, to give us an overview of what the year's been like in Echo Voices. Um, my name's Gail Bowser, and I know you're used to seeing Deb Fitzgibbons up, up front in these uh, Echo Voices sessions, but she is taking some well-deserved time uh, to do other things in her life after we just finished the uh, AT Ties Together conference last week. So I hope if you didn't get to attend that conference, I hope you did. It was a wonderful event. Lots of interaction and lots of really important sessions about assistive technology. As you know, all Echo Voices sessions are recorded and you can get CEUs through your registration for these sessions by just uh, signing up as you have done today. Or if you know somebody who wants to watch the recording, they can also get CEUs for watching the recording. There's a test, a pre and post test that they'll have to take in order to get CEUs for watching the recording. Um, as you know, Zoom has closed captioning available and I forgot to turn it on. So, oh dear, where'd it go? I think I know what I'm doing and then look what happened. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute and find the captioning. Live transcription, you, um, now should be seeing live transcription at the bottom of your screen. And if you want it in a different place, you can move it around or um, change the size of the font to make it fit your needs. We find that a lot of people like the, the live transcription, not only if they have a hearing imp hip impairment, but also if they uh, just want to follow the conversation a little more closely. <laughs> we are the Oregon Technology Access Program. Uh, Brittany is with us here today. She's a the behind the scenes person who always makes sure everything works for us. So um, thank you for joining us, Brittany. We are housed at Douglas Education Service District in Roseburg, Oregon and sponsored by the Oregon Department of Education. We invite you to participate actively in our conversations. Echo Voices really is set up to hear your voices as well as the kids that we serve who might be using augmented communication. So uh, unmute yourself, ask questions. Kelly's a pro at handling questions on the fly. And um, we welcome you to participate in this conversation. I'm Gail Bowser. I work as an independent consultant for Douglas ESD and the Oregon Technology Access Program. So I, as I said, will be your host today. Oop, that was a mouse click. As I said, Deb, uh, Fitzgibbons is our coordinator, both OTAP and the regional and statewide services for students with orthopedic impairments, but she is not able to be with us today. We wanted to tell you about our final session for the Echo Ties um, project, which you also may be participating in. It's on the alternate Wednesdays, so our next Echo Ties will be next Wednesday, May 12th. And we'll have Susan Cahill back from the, uh, the American As As Association of Occupational Therapists. Um, she has been with us all year in the Echo 
Ties Therapy for Educational Settings, and she's going to do a wrap up for us next week. We also wanted to remind you if you are a therapist, OTPT, and we've had lots of speech and language clinicians joining us in the last uh, month or so, we will have a, one more statewide town hall for therapists in this school year, and that will be May 24th from 1.30 to 3.30 Pacific time. Anybody's invited, we're getting inquiries from other states about whether they can join us too. They can, but the information in these town hall meetings is very specific to Oregon, to Oregon licensure questions, to Oregon processes and, um, and rules. So uh, what we're finding is people are learning from us and from our conversations the things that they may need to talk about in other settings. We also wanted to, you to know that we're planning ahead for next year already. Our feeding seminar, our annual feeding seminar uh, will be October 28th and 29th, 2021. Um, so save those dates because we've been doing a lot of work on feeding and feeding teams. And there'll be some great information for that web that seminar too. But now I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can see Kelly Foner and we can learn from her today. Um, I see Brittany's put a link to the handouts in the chat box. And we've had a few more people join us. So welcome, Kelly. Thanks for doing this. Sure. Well, hi, Gail. Hi, Brittany. Hi, everyone that we have in our group. I think, you know, we are in May and we're following a week of a wonderful three days of professional development at the Ties Together conference. I was able to attend all three days and was really excited about getting some content from people that I hadn't heard from before. And so one of the things I did this session last year, the wrap up session at the end of um, the echo year. And it put me into that position of going back and reviewing the sessions that I had been to and watching ones that I hadn't. So I really appreciate that everything's recorded and you can kind of do it on your own time. And I'm sure, you know, just as we all, you all are very busy here in May, we'll have this recorded so that people can have their wrap up too when it works best for them. So what I've done in the handout, let me get my screen up here. What I've done in the handout is really gone through all of the sessions in Echo Voices. So going back and reminding everyone that you can go to the website and link to all of the presentations from this year and last year uh, with links to handouts, recordings, and so what I did was I pulled out my, what I call my two takes, two takeaways from each of the sessions. Um, I was lucky enough to attend probably half the sessions um, in person. Two of them I did, so <laughs> had to be there, uh, but I was able to attend about half of them live. So that was really wonderful. Um, and I'm gonna get my presentation. And we're gonna go through the sessions. And um, as Gail said, please, we're a very small group here today. Please unmute yourself and you know add to what you had as a takeaway to the different presenters. So just as a quick review, we had sessions that were involved in AAC planning. So everywhere from Gail's launch and talking about integrating AAC into all of our different types of classroom environments. We, we just had the session a couple of weeks ago from David McNaughton on transition planning. Um, I live in Wisconsin and David did that session for us as a wrap up last year at the end of our ECHO project. It was really great way to look at you know, trends for futures for our um, K-12 students moving into um, post-secondary environments. We also started out this year with the emergency planning session from Julie Beans that 
talked about, you know, all of those. And it was really good for me to go back through um, her session. There's so many golden nuggets in there. Of course, Jane Corston, who presented last week at the uh, Ties Together conference, um, brought information about her new resources um, from their project of Every Move Counts, Clicks and Chats, and connecting to families with that. And then, of course, speaking of family members as well as educator, uh, with Aaron Sheldon and the participation model, and then Aaron's presentation last week on really the sequence of her daughter uh, going through and where she finds herself now with, you know, um, 18 year old um, who uses a variety of technologies and is a complex communicator. There were also sessions on strategies, everywhere from using some specific strategies like the assistiveware core classroom, using music. Um, I hope you followed up with some of the things from Steven's session. And if not, we'll remind you about all of the music that's there and the songs and the visuals in different symbol systems. Uh, ever since I saw Steven's presentation, I've been using them with my students online. Um, Tabby talks about Master Pal, you know, and that being a good modeler um, and being a good communication partner. What are our strategies for that? Uh, Bridget spoke about, you know, getting started with, with what it was information beyond getting started. You know, things, all of the things that you need to consider. And that's definitely a session to review when you're pulling new teams together or have new staff members into AAC so that people know what's involved. Just a couple of weeks ago, I attended Phil McComer's um, session on the Art of Oral presentation where she pulled things out of her PACT project. And I know many of you are using the PACT framework um, and looking that specifically at you know, AAC and how we can enhance student presentation. Um, I, they had me speak about low-tech systems. Um, and so I went through different features of low-tech systems. And then we also had sessions that were really about, you know, families and involving the self of the AAC communicator, looking at the environment of virtual with Chris Gibbons and the strategies that we've learned um, in, you know, for many of us in a year of distance teaching and how, you know, Chris talked about how we need to not forget those lessons, but bring them into our present day practice. Um, I had a session on collaborating with parents and looking at some of the myths that are out there. And the myths in that session aren't just parental myths, you know, about AAC. They are definitely take on the full scope of myths about core boards or myths about the practices in AAC that I hear from educators as well as family members. And Deanna Wagner, what a wonderful session she gave us with talking about having your clients, your students share the stories of themselves with really practical applications and how to get that started. Uh, so another good one to go back and watch if you haven't or rewatch it to get some new strategies. So what I want to do is just go session by session. As I said, I pulled out two takes, um, two takeaways with screenshots um, from the presentations from the presenters. And I, again, I'm going to invite Gail and those of you here to unmute yourself so that you can add to um, and make this more of a discussion um, than me just telling you my two takes. As I mentioned, Gail launched us off. Um, and two of the big, it was, there were so many things in that session to take away. Two of the big takeaways, I really like these factors lists. There were a couple factor lists throughout that session, but just those things that remind you what impacts our students, you know, and all students, no matter what it is that they bring to the table. And then I also like that, you know, we, many of us are working in virtual environments and having some guidelines, and there's a couple screenshots of guidelines. This is just the first one from a set of three, I believe. Gail, things that you want us to take away from, woo, way back in October. <laughs> you know, I've been 
I'm a teacher by training, so my history um, really affects how I think about th things, particularly AAC and AT, because if we really want it useful, it has to be integrated into classroom routines and daily activities. And this idea that classroom management and the way you have your classroom structured and the, and the routine set up has more impact on how much students learn than their socioeconomic group, their level of disability. Um, I, it, all those other things that are in this list are important, but I'm just fascinated by if we have structures and routines and ways of doing things, what we see is that kids learn more. So um, I actually have a whole full day workshop that I do on classroom management and assistive technology that relates to this first slide. The second one, um, we've been learning all year about how to do virtual technology. This was an example of some of the routines that I was seeing last uh, September being, being used, but I thought I could take just a second and tell you a story. My uh, daughter-in-law is a Head Start instructional assistant and they've been virtual all year. And um, so she works with a group of eight four-year-olds and because they had routines, because they had systems for doing things, she tells me that those kids have learned the routines in their virtual classrooms and that every day they dance and all those four-year-olds know how to take off their headsets, unplug it from the computer so they can hear the music. And then they all stand up and dance to the music. And when it's over, they know to put their headsets back on and plug it back into the computer so they can finish the school day. So uh, to me, that's just a really powerful story about having technology routines. Wow, awesome. And I think if you take Gail's session and bring it in with the information from Bridget and Tabby and Aaron, I mean, if you're looking for a good start in organizing um, your classroom and activities that promote communication in your classroom, those, that's a good foresight right there for sure. Anybody that's joining us live want to add what you might have taken away from Gail's session or questions since we have the author of the session here with us? Well, please do feel free to put things into the chat box too, because as Gail said, we're pretty flexible here in this presentation. I don't have a long agenda like I usually do to power through. The and next, see, go ahead, Gail. Uh, I see that Brittany's put uh, the link to all the different handouts in the chat box, yours specifically, but you can get from there to any of these slides that you're seeing. Oh, that's great. Thank for the you. Whole set. Um, Julia talked about emergency planning. And this one I was not able to attend live. And so when I, I watched the video and I went through the handout, there's a lot of gems in here from the emergency preparedness list that go, and then the presentation goes into like each section of emergency planning and whether or not something is happening when you're in home or when you're at school, you know, when you're in the community. Things like, and then very practical aspects like this to um, go bag, um, to go bag. Some of us that live in tornado country or have these kinds of to go bags, but I think this customization to an augmented communicator is really critical. Gail, any takeaways you have from the emergency planning session? Well, I what popped into my mind was you're looking at tornadoes we had i can't i don't know a person in oregon last summer who didn't uh get go bags for our forest fires so um that presentation was really timely because we were kind of just coming off the end of fire season here um and i will say that the pandemic is has been a kind of an emergency and we do have a state grant about the pandemic that, um, or about emergency planning that had to pivot to 
um, emergency planning it during the pandemic. So if you're still looking for information, um, you might go to Julia's work and also look at that state grant about emergency planning. Excellent, good tip. Melanie the, says, okay. this was an eye opener for me as I hadn't thought of these students of these four students without physical disabilities. Yeah, it really was. I know as I rewatched it, um, and when I, when I went through the PowerPoint after I had watched it, um, I was thinking was thinking about how this presentation could be modularized as a great presentation with families, you know, so that we would talk about what you're planning, you know, and and for some families that may be hesitant to think about how augmentative communication relates to them. When your child's out in the world in the middle of an emergency, we wanna make sure that there's low tech communication strategies with them, as well as the essential basic needs of water and medical supplies and food. But I think that, yeah, it really was a big eye opener. I agree, Melanie. Then Bridget. So Bridget came to, uh, in to talk about really getting up and running. There were so many different components to this session. Um, and I love this think about list, you know, that it wasn't just about a to do, but things to, that are to ingrain yourself with, that they can be, that our augmented communicators can be successful with a variety of systems. I've had kids who maybe got started with one type of technology and moved to another kind of technology, always trying to look at that language intact piece of it all. But that, you know, in all of assistive technology, we always talk about that it's not about the tool, it's about your plan. You know, it's about the services around providing the tools and that we need to prepare ourselves for that constantly changing and evolving environment. She also put together some nice sections on some of those beginning strategies like aided language stimulation and modeling. And so I think that you get, you know, a really good start without getting too in depth into any one of um, kind of the launching up point strategies. Um, and Bridget's very practical um, as she shares her information. She has lots of experience with students you know, now she might work for a manufacturer currently, but she has a wealth of serving individuals um, through the, the various projects that she's worked for in Minnesota and other locations. Gail, any memories from Bridget's presentation? What I remember is she had so many good ideas, I couldn't keep track of them. And she's on my list of, of ones to watch again. So um, I, I think you did a great job of summarizing, but she uh, has a great deal of experience working with parents. And I think that was particularly useful. It was coincidence for us in Echo Voices that we had a whole year where our primary, you know, consulting group was at some level parents. Um, but yeah, I just want to watch it again. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's worth going through the slide deck again. <laughs> yeah, even if you don't have time to watch the whole thing. Yeah. That's one thing I love about having all the handouts up is you can go get those gems and, and then just watch part of the recording if you want. Aaron Sheldon with the participation model. The participation model has, has been something that I've used for, you know, numerous years. And you know, the way that she puts her perspective on it, I really liked, I put on the right there, just one of the many surveys that she did with the group that attended that day. So think, looking at how, what kinds of things impact and influence participation. So if the participation model is new to you, um, developed by Drs. Buchelman and Miranda. And then as Erin put it together, took you through the various components from all of the things around opportunities, like this image on the left, uh, what are the different opportunity barriers, and then what are the access barriers. And I think sometimes when we talk about participation, 
which I think Aaron did a good job at really clarifying, is it's got many components to it. It isn't just about how much do you talk with your device. It also has to do with what things impede your participation with practices or even the knowledge level of the staff around a student impacts their level of participation. And then she went through um, like the second half of the presentation were strategies of um, impacting participation. So what kinds of things would um, like for here, remove the, bar the practice barrier, would remove attitudinal barriers? What kinds of things can you do to remove knowledge barriers? And she gave um, suggestions, but also took wonderful input from you know, the group of all of you. So that's, a, and that's another nice thing to go back and look at to see, oh, what are some of the strategies to use in upping participation? Anyone else have any takeaways from Aaron's? You know, I will say whenever I know or have an opportunity to, to hear Aaron speak, I take it. Um, she has such a, a breadth of information since she's a, a parent of a child with a significant disability. Um, and and a practitioner and now works for a vendor also so she she sees the whole scope i see in the chat melanie says i wasn't able to attend this one but now i want to see it yeah and i highly recommend it i first met erin when she was attending the conference closing the gap when her daughter was in elementary school or actually i think she was just transitioning from preschool into elementary school and you know and as the parent in the audience the kinds of questions that she asked you know really got to some of the heart of issues that she was having she would share from the audience she would share the kinds of practices that they were doing um, when we had those kind of interactive activity times and it was i was so glad when um she found the time to start being able to share more formally all of her experiences. And I think we will just continue as we saw last week at the conference, we're just gonna to continue to learn from Erin as her daughter matures. Tabby, I mean, we had Tabby last year as well in ECHO. And I think for many people try to put practices of aided language stimulation and modeling and Sometimes I think sometimes people get too in depth with it and Tabby just lays it out so that it is, why aren't I doing this? <laughs> I love this idea of the communication house, you know, that how that impacts how we all, not just our students, but how we all communicate. And that being a pal, you know, being a master pal really isn't just about how well do you know how to use this kid's device? I have a lot of people that are stuck with the idea that everybody needs to know where every word and every device or every communication book is and that they need to be talking with it every single moment of the day. And that's not what we're talking about. You know, when Tabby talks about modeling, we're modeling from the student's perspective, not what we are saying as another way of communicating to students, but that we are adding to their language at whatever level they are producing, but not adding too much. Um, and I think those kinds of cautions were really um, critical to aided language stimulation practices as well. So she, and I, I think, as I said, I think she just makes it very doable. And this is another one of those sessions that you could take apart and use this for staff development and do different components of it. Um, I've been in school systems where we have like a half hour after school and you know everybody gets online or, we, or in person and we do certain practices. And I think you could really do that with Tabby's information. You know, one of the things that I love about the field of assistive technology is that we're really good at sharing. 
and Tabby had provided to us and anybody else who wants to look her whole set of modules and training information and things like that. So you really could, I mean, she encourages us to do it. You really could take her, her materials and um, use them, like you said, in a half hour end of the school day training session or something like that. So a wonderful resource that she has shared with everyone. Yeah. Yeah, the sharing the practical stuff is just really terrific. Um, Jane Corston tipped every move counts on its head and with being able to again make it practical bring it to people who really are on the ground with their own children and how where we might have looked at strategies where a lot of people come into every move counts as the assessment and the implementation strategies but how do we look at this kind of sensory approach to communication across all environments that it isn't just about a training environment. Um, Jane also shared, and I put that reminder here of um, where the downloads were that you could get um, to use after that session with the family guide. Gail, any takeaways from Jane's session? Well, whenever we have a family guide, I always wanna say, but it's not just for families. Um, this guide is a wonderful uh, almost introduction to the pretty uh, extensive use of um, of every move counts it's a great way to help teachers who are new to the concepts or instructional assistants and it's an audience way bigger than families although i appreciate that they did write it directly to families and um Melanie, I see you said, I love this one. I got the guide and shared it with my colleagues. If, you, if you're if you able to, I'm wondering, can you uh, open up your mic and tell us how you shared it, how you found it useful? Because this is a resource we can all get right now. So I'm a physical therapist, so it's not usually, this is all new to me. So I kind of like came to some of them. I wasn't able to come to all of them, but I was blown away and my best friend's a speech path and I was going on and on. And she's like, well, yeah, because she's done all these things before. <laughs> but um, I work in a classroom that's uh, um, with kids with, uh, I guess they started with primary autism and the communication needs, but it's branched out more. And I just, I made, I was like, told the teacher, I'm like, you need this. This is just so amazing. And it's, it was really embarrassing because um, I've been practicing for a while to like realize, um, find something that fits what the child can do as opposed to make the child or teach the child how to do a system. It seems like so obvious when she said it, but to be quite honest, like it never even, because I hadn't ever been what I was exposed to. It's okay, these are your choices and you kind of teach them how to do it and then and when she did that, it was like this whole new world, like, oh my goodness. So then of course, you know, it's like, I wanted to go share with everybody. I'm like, did you know this? <laughs> and of course, you know, several people, well, obviously the speech paths, but um, knew, but like the teacher was kind of like, oh, uh, that's that's really good. And then um, I shared it with, and my coworkers, the OTs who were also at the thing, but I just, um, I just was really impressed. And the fact that she's just sharing it for free because she really wants all these families and staff and teachers to be able to do, I, I just, um, for the ones that I, I was impressed with everything because again, this is totally outside my wheelhouse, but um, this one just blew me away and just really made me very excited and wanted to learn more and do more and, you know, trying to figure out how to stay, you know, not stay, but like use it within my world, but then also like share with others. Oh, that's fabulous, Melanie. Your reaction to this reminds me of the reaction that we often get from people who um, are first introduced to the communication matrix. Um, the communication matrix, one of the publications that goes along with it is a was originally created as a family questionnaire, but we have found that therapists and teachers where augmentative and alternative communication and behavioral communication um, strategies aren't, as you say, part of your wheelhouse, really say, oh, this made things make sense to me. Um, and so if you're interested in the communication matrix, there's a session from last year uh, that I think um, Emily from 
um, Oregon Health and Science University did one or two baby sessions on that. Okay, uh, thank you. Because I was just going to ask you about that um, because I did not join any of the. Because again, I'm a PT, so I kind of was like, oh. Um, but then there was some reason I somehow got off, and I was thinking it was the echo ties, and then I and then there were I. Um, it was one of the earlier ones. And I'm like, this was amazing. And so then when I could, I tried to join more of them. Oh, that's good. When I was reviewing the um, Echo Voices sessions, I also crossed over into the Echo Ties. And I was like, oh, I should be watching more of these. <laughs> I, well, it's just like the more you listen, then the more you want to know. And then you more you're just like, give me more, give me more. And that's why I wanted to come today is kind of like, because I've probably made a third to half. And so to get to hear you finalize and then I can go okay that looks like one I should go back to that looks like because again the reality is I would love to see all of them but you know time and and opportunity and so highlighting every of them so thank yeah. you well good you know, this is probably a good time to say that we um, are involved in a research study through the University of Wyoming and you all haven't heard about it um, just yet because we were waiting until our echo voices and our echo ties sessions wound down um but we will be sending you uh if you if you registered for any of the echo sessions that we produce we will be sending you a very short questionnaire i think it's maybe 10 questions and one of them is what's your what's your discipline um and that information is being compiled at the university of wyoming to try and figure out what the results of um of doing echo, professional development in this particular way are. Um, some people have said, well, if you just have, you know, a one topic webinar for 45 minutes once every other week, we don't know what kind of impact echo is having on the field. But, um, you know, Melanie, your kind of uh, endorsement of these kind of echo sessions really uh, we're hopeful that we'll see those kinds of comments from a bunch of other people too. So watch for that survey and um, it's a national study. So we'll see how we're doing in ECHO. I think that's a great idea. And honestly, I was so excited when you started the ECHO ties, what was it, three years ago? Because it was just, um, and the virtual, because you know, it's so hard for us to get to get all in one place and um to be quite honest i've loved the ties being virtual because it's just so much easier to like include it in your day because sometimes you can't commit so much and so i've been loving the the echo ties and then also the fact that you record them so if you miss the ones that you that you can't see so and just getting the introduction to the different things so you can find out more and then like decide what you want to learn more about and so i do i've been very excited with that so thank you very much gail well, thank you for that. And I should tell you, uh, my understanding is that Deb is planning a hybrid conference for next year. So we'll have live sessions because we all want to be back together in the same room, but also a lot of it will be offered virtually too. At least awesome. that's the plan right now. And you know how things change. Thank you. All right. Well, and I have not been bringing up the case studies too that every that follow each of these sessions, which is so important to the ECHO model. Um, here in Wisconsin, we also have um, an ECHO voices sessions that um, happen out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And our last session that was, you know, kind of for everyone was um, second week of April or third week of April. And now for the next month, they're doing weekly sessions with parents and it's a parent only echo group. So I've got a couple of parents that are attending and I'm excited to hear from them what their takeaways are. Um, I did a session on, talk, speaking of parents, um, I did a session on uh, collaborating with parents and looking at kind of the myth busters, you know, what people seem to hear in the wind about augmentative and alternative communication, whether it's not or not your child is ready for it, which we know everyone, <laughs> um, there aren't any prerequisites. 
for AAC. Um, I love this statement from Pat Miranda of the only prerequisite skill for AAC is breathing. And when she says that live, she adds, and it can be assisted breathing as well. So <laughs> we um, use that. And I know when, you know, we often focus on K-12, but this impacts me in my family um, and in my family life with elderly relatives, you know, who have lost the ability to speak. Um, I have a sister-in-law with cerebral palsy who learned, who lived to be 72 years old that used probably for the last 20 years of her life, used low-tech augmentative communication. And so the use of core strategies and those kinds of things, it's important that people understand their um, practical applications and not to be swayed because somebody had an attitude. I don't know. I don't know how else to, to put that. Gail, anything to say about Miss? <laughs> I I really appreciated this session because you told your stories. And I just think that's such a powerful way to do um, echo. If our if our goal is to get people engaged and involved and thinking about how could how can I do it myself? then I think that's just a really powerful way of, of doing things. So that's my overall thought about that. Yeah, and that's what, you know, it's hard, it's hard to go back to your own work and say, what are my two big takeaways from my own stuff? But I constantly run into this issue that's on the screenshot on the right, which core vocabulary for speaking is the same as core vocabulary for learning to read. That people think that when we talk about core words, you know, you've got an educator hat on for the academic sight word piece, but you then other people have their language hat on for that. And, and some of the words cross over, but they're not all completely the same. And I've run into too many students where people, you know, both the speech language pathologist and the teacher, um, they're cord yes, they are coordinating, but then what's happening is that there are words that are truly foundational sight words that are being left out um, in reading instruction because they're not like in the core list of the year, which is really meant for expressive communication. So there are those kinds of misunderstandings that can impact a child's learning for sure. Um, Terry talked about the, this is one of those, strat, those um, sessions that really dug in to a resource that was out there. Last year, we had a session from Dr. Carol Zangari about all the things that were in the practical AAC website. And so Terry really went through, and it was so hard for me to say, what were my two takeaways? Well, one was to make sure that everybody knows about this resource and that this resource is, is not just tied to products from assistive wear. So, I mean, although it was originally focused in many of the examples and videos are focused on Proloquo to go, these are strategies that can be applied to most of the major language systems that are out there. Um, and there's so many um, overall, you know, they'll give you, you know, what are the impact words? And then they'll give you activities. And I love what it, so what I pulled out as an activities and anybody that knows me knows that this is crazy that I put bubbles on the screen because I think to me as a teacher, everybody complains about how much teachers overdo morning meeting. I, as a teacher complain about how much speech therapists overdo bubbles, um, that bubbles are the answer to everything. And then here I grabbed this bubble example. <laughs> um, but I love these five minute um, activities because they are, they're the things that we don't think about the in-between times. We don't think about downtime and how that can be very communicative. And so the five minute ideas are really wonderful. And it just happened that in Terry's slide deck, she had pulled up, she pulled up the bubble one. Gail, anything to add to this? I just <laughs> laugh at myself. <laughs> No, um, I, I do think it's funny you added bubbles, but um, we really, um, I, I guess we, what this session really uh, pointed out to me was that we have so many resources. We're, 
we're often um, trying to reinvent our classrooms, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel as we do these sessions. Um, and Terry pointed out how we could use stuff in, um, it was, it's just a wonderful resource of ideas. Um, I think it's an underused resource. It is yeah, an underused that resource. Myth that, I think, yeah. That people I think, think that people can't people use do unless assume you it's prolific to go. go. Um, Hillary says, I loved using these activities this year. The five minute activities provided buy-in from the uh, assistants working with these students. That's really nice to hear. Hillary, you want to tell us anything more about that? Hi, I'm, I'm really Claire on Hillary's login. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, no, the, the activities were great. And what we're fine, what I've been finding is that the um, assistants working with these students not only don't don't have time to learn devices, but don't don't they're they're focused on getting their um, their their data for you know their own um, agendas from the teacher, and so the AAC just kind of falls to the side until you come up with a very fun activity that's just a few minutes long that they can actually squeeze in to their time with the child. So they've been really a great resource for buy-in and it's helped them understand that, that yes, AAC is serious, but it needs to be fun and, and it can be in the simplest ways. Oh, such a good example. And I, I love that idea about really maybe focusing these on assistance um, because then they can also find that vocabulary that maybe might be used throughout the day and they can give those kinds of hints and clues to their students say, oh, remember when we did the, I'm not going to say bubbles activity. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> pet peeve. <laughs> well I said. Think it, I also think it teaches a way of thinking. Yes. Um, this, and especially these little five minute activities. So how could you make up your own five minute activity would be the next step in the level of sophistication. It's a really good, I mean, that's a really good um, comment, Gail, because I remember as I got started, I was a pair, I was one of those pair pros that was assigned to a kid, to a kindergartner that I, you know, did all who had complex needs. So when we got his first language board and then his first device, you know, my focus was really just making it through our day. And it was have, letting him be successful throughout the kindergarten day. And until I learned more about what this was all about. This wasn't just him being able to answer answer Miss Jean's questions. And I can't even believe I remember that person's name from way back then. But you know, I learned so much just by being beside him um, as the SLP would model what it was that we should be doing. And so when I had, you know, my own students that I was responsible for and who had AAC learning to integrate it within the context of activities, which is what, you know, all of the kinds of things that are on this AssistiveWare website. And I'll add to it, Amanda Hartman's videos are fabulous. She is so much fun. Um, she has, I think she's at this point putting out a weekly video of different activities. Um, and so if you go to AssistiveWare's YouTube site, um, I'm pretty sure most of them are linked within the core classroom. But if you go to YouTube and go to Assist of Where, I mean, she has some really great, great examples and things that you can do right along. I have some parents that turn on Amanda's videos and they are there right with their child doing the same things that Amanda is doing. Um, another, you know, real practice practitioner is Chris Gibbons. And Chris talked about, you know, this virtual learning space and the things of supporting kids with AAC at a distance that, and one of the things I really liked about his session was there were so many takeaways. One was that change in perspective, you know, that everybody felt so overwhelmed by going to distance learning. But Chris reminded us, these are the things that we do things go wrong when you're in person, you know, and, and there's ways that we pull strategies together and we need to 
relook this list of um, changing expectations. Hopefully, if I only gave you half the list, I would entice you to go in and, and see the other half of the list. But it's just reminders of like, oh yeah. Like I think so many times through his presentation, I was like, yeah, <laughs> yes. Like I was nodding my head throughout the whole thing. And he just pulled it together, um, pulled together that information in a really great way. And I just, you know, that kind of practical in your face of, isn't this what we wanted all along? I mean, we've I've listened for years about people complaining that parents don't do enough with their kids' AAC system, or we never get a chance to use their AAC system in the home. And then suddenly we're all put into people's homes virtually. You know, this is what we were looking for. So, you know, don't keep complaining. This is what we can do and go with it. And then what can we take away from what we've learned through virtual? Um, services and bring into in-person services. I have a team now that's facing this that had a student that's been virtual, you know, since last March. And that student came back to school last week. Um, and he, that student had come in a couple of times for testing and assessment things, but to spend a full day at school, this was the first time was, you know, last week of April. And what they're finding is that there are different ways to apply the, for example, prompting strategies that we've been using virtually online. And how does that change in person? We might be still looking at least to most prompting hierarchies, but there, may, there are other issues that come into play because now you're in person right, rather than that virtual. And in that particular student's case, there was somebody um, in that student's home beside them um, supporting locally. And then school staff and therapy staff were always virtual. So now those two things have merged and it does change up, but we take away what we learned about him all through these months and apply it to in-person learning. You know, Kelly, one of my jobs with the Oregon Technology Access Program is to help build the schedule for Echo Voices for next year. And um, I just made a note that we probably need to have Chris and you back to talk about that return to school thing, because it's really, um, I think, going to be an interesting and challenging time to figure out how to carry forward the good things we learned during the pandemic into face-to-face -face services again. Yeah, and we might be having to talk about re-energizing those of us that will still be teaching online because I have a caseload of students who, because of their medical fragility, are not going to be returning to face-to-face -face school. This opened up and what their families can see um, of how much more their children are staying healthy um, and learning academically and communicatively as well. So yeah, we might need to be re-energize your, your virtual learning too. And Hillary says, yes, do it. So we'll uh, put it on the list. All right, very good. So yeah, Chris is fabulous. Um, I did a session on low tech. We had first started talking about this session was just gonna be one of the, on pod books. Um, what's one of the communication languages that I'm an instructor for, but we looked at it more holistically at what were people doing with low tech boards. There's so many low tech boards that have been made available by manufacturers um, so that if people already have language in place, use those, but it's also a great assessment ground. It's also a great way of having communication strategies throughout your classrooms before individual systems are assessed and placed. So the two things that I pulled out of this session was on the left-hand side is this kind of, what do you need to think about? You need to think about the format. You need to think about your access. You need to think about that symbol set, the language the, or whatever page set, whatever you wanna call it um, and what needs to be included. And then we looked more in depth into those language sets, into all the different types of language organization systems that we see in high tech systems 
and how they're applied in low tech systems. So I've been doing this session throughout this school year um, as kind of there's been a resurgence of low tech systems. Um, and I think we, we had some nice participation during this session. Gail, anything or anybody, anything to add to this? Um, this is Claire again. Um, yeah, that was um, a wonderful um, session with your thoughts on that because so the systems in, in my experience this year, the systems often go down, the battery's not charged, um, <laughs> you know, any number of things happen. And then um, um, going back to the, the low tech systems is not, not what um, some people wanted to do. But when behaviors started popping up and um, it was clear that like that, that pictures always help, they almost never hurt, <laughs> that, that, um, that they were, they're very necessary to still keep and have around in, in these cases. Oh, very good. Yeah, I've, I've started calling them companion systems so that your low tech is your companion system to your high tech. So, cause I know people do get that kind of, oh, we're going back to low tech, like it's somehow we've regressed, but it's not, it's application of AAC that's best within the environment that you're in right now and the situation. And your power runs out, your power runs out. You still need to communicate. Yes, very well said. <laughs> Put a little bit of thought into it. You know, this conversation just makes me feel old. Um, I started doing AAC with Oops. students before there were any oh, yeah. electronic devices. So I spent hours and hours and hours cutting out pictures from magazines and pasting them on paper boards. Um, it, uh, until you said it just now, it never occurred to me that somebody might not want to do AAC because the battery ran out. <laughs> so um, just makes me feel like an old lady, which I am, so that's okay. I did. We had, there was a conversation that took place during one of the sessions at the conference last week where we talked about, um, I'm trying to remember who the presenter was, you know, that we would take our, our volumes one, two, and three, Mayor Johnson, PCS symbols, and I could only go after school when the secretary wasn't there to make all the copies because she would be sitting there like counting how many copies that I made every time I, I showed up at the copy machine. So I would and do that, it after her time was done. And that was the high tech solution because we had standardized symbols. I literally collected magazines so that we could make communication boards for kids. Yeah, yeah. We had symbols with stick that were sticker sets. Yeah, it's, it, we've come a long way since low tech was the only tech. Um, a wonderful session that really brought the humanity to AAC was Deanna Wagner. And Deanna has so much experience with AAC communicators that, I mean, I just, it's just ingrained in her uh, with everything that she thinks about to think about the consumer first. Um, and so this idea, and I've seen, you know, I've seen as she's kind of developed this strategy of putting stories together, um, whether it's introductory stories, which are some of the takeaways that I had. Um, we had used some of Deanna's strategies in a camp that I worked with to make sure that all the teenagers had introductory, not just like say your name, but who am I? And being able to, and not like list off your name and your address and that kind of stuff, but things that are meaningful to you. Um, and I just, well, Deanna's like just one of my favorite presenters ever. And so, you know, bringing out who it is, it's for, for those of you that may work with individuals that are at end of life, you know, we have these all about me stories that people will make with individuals who might be changing um, living situations and might be have more caregivers than they have. Um, home-based people around them. And so making sure that caregivers know who you are and what your interests are and who the people in your life are, these things are so important. And it really makes, you know, brings out personality. Um, and I think one of the things I'm trying to, 
Oh, I love this quote. Brian Whitmore is the developer of the cough drop app. And, but he's also a father of a team who has complex communication needs. And I really, anything that talks about children's personalities and their opinions, it's beyond the basic needs and wants, right? It's, it's the things that make it worth communicating um, about, you know, whatever it is that you have to say to whomever, whenever. So some nice examples that Deanna pulled out in her presentation, a really good case study went along with this session. Like I said, I just, the word humanity, it just exudes the whole, the whole thing. It makes me happy. <laughs> Gail, yeah. takeaways from Deanna. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that, that I know about Deanna is that the bulk of her most recent experiences with adults who use AAC, she's doing a lot of work in different adult environments. And I think that it, it was kind of infused into the presentation that she did for us, but I think it's such an important thing to have a, a vision of what kinds of things um, will happen after students leave us in the school setting. And Kelly, you mentioned end of life stories. Um, Brian's quote is about his son, um, who's I think out of school now. Um, I'm not sure, but but to have that vision of where we are going with augmentative communication after kids leave us in the public school setting. Yeah, the other part, if it, and this doesn't have to do with this presentation, but Deanna is also a dual language speaker. She is fluent in Spanish. And so her work on the practical AAC website as well as the Isaac organization um, is to be a part of the chats that are in the Spanish language. So not only does Deanna speak Spanish, understand it, but she also AAC speaks Spanish. Uh, so she's kind of my go-to person when I need that resource. Um, I'm always firing off an email to her or looking for her posts on various blogs. Um, I mentioned Stephen already. I had first seen Stephen at, I, now I can't remember, we had him in the Wisconsin Echo and then he was in the Oregon Echo. And I think they probably were within, you know, a month or two of each other. Um, and I have used this resource ever since. Um, and I have students that love music, that are motivated by music. There's, um, so he's got a website and I think I've got the link on there or make, oh, the link is in his handouts. If you go to YouTube and you do um, songs for language, but he, the, the songs are in different groups. He talked during his presentation, he talked a lot about core vocabulary and the things that influence it. It wasn't just about playing songs, you know, but just how music influences our language development. Um, as well. One of the things that when you do go and check out the website and look, when you click on any of these core vocabulary words, um, it will appear. And then before you choose like the song you see the picture of on the right, you choose which um, symbol set. So whether you're looking at unity symbols or you're looking at symbol sticks or you're looking at the PCS symbols, he has things in very, oh, and I think lesson pick symbols as well. Um, so that was really helpful because I have some students that are very, um, I don't know what the word is, symbol centric, that they were, the, that's their symbol set, or it might be the staff or family around them that is symbol centric, rather than understanding that we need to be multiple symbol language speakers um, as well. So yeah, good good information that you can use right away from Stephen's session. Gail, anything to add to that? My only um, comment about Stephen's session was that I wished it were twice as long because he gave us such good theory, but we didn't get to hear a lot of the music. So again, I, I mentioned that I'm making lists of speakers for next year and 
I want to invite him back to really give us more examples of the actual songs that he's providing. And again, kudos to him for sharing all of his work. I know he loves the work he's doing, but he's shared it in such effective ways. Um, it's just been delightful to get to know him. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, he's somebody that before Echo that I didn't have a lot of awareness of. Um, I had, Deb had mentioned him that she had seen him at ATIA, I think it was, that he did a presentation. Um, and I remember hearing people talk about the core vocabulary music guy. Uh, but I didn't really put, you know, put it all together until it was through these Echo sessions. Right. I thought he was just a guy with some cool songs, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're so well organized and so flexible, depending on your own needs. Yeah, very good. And then Phil, who, you know, has the pact, I know that many people in Oregon are following this model of um, material accommodation and modifications. And then all the examples that she, I mean, she's always has so many rich examples that come from real life work with real kids, you know, real people working with real kids, working really hard. And she just, there are so many, this is one of the ones on the right that was just so practical to me, like question and answer. Oh, and they could just be attached together because sometimes we make things too hard and sometimes we make accommodations too difficult. Um, but Phil really pulls it together into things that are very doable. Uh, yeah, I don't have any additional comments. Um, her system works so beautifully and it really touches my teacher heart. Um, she's, she's got lovely ways of including instruction in almost any topic in her work. Yeah, very good. And I see that we have um, in the chat, Hillary is agreeing with the bringing Stephen back. <laughs> So I just posted in the chat. Um, I really, I have a list of four now sessions that we might want to consider for next year. So if you have more, please do uh, make suggestions, uh, presenters, but also topics. Yeah, if we have go. the topic, we can find the, the right presenter for you. And I think in the beginning, I mentioned that I had seen David McNaughton at the end of last school year um, with as a part of our Wisconsin ECHO project. But then to have him present again, and he, he's another one with those real life examples that you know that these kinds of lists, like the list on the left of the things that are most important, came from working with real people, you know, and it, of course, all the video that was a part of this presentation and how various AAC systems were integrated into the lives of, you know, post-secondary, um, whether it was work life or academic life, post-secondary schooling, those kinds of things were great. And, you know, David at Penn State, they're um, a big center for looking at the use of visual scenes. And I think he really helps to make the language organizational strategy of visual scenes very practical, where it isn't just like put a picture and let's make everything talk on it. But how do we really use that in somebody's day-to-day, -day, work life, school life, and home life. So I really appreciate um, David. And, and he's another one of those educators. You know, is he a speech language pathologist because of how he speaks? But he's an educator at heart um, with a, a, a lot of AAC and literacy background. And more information can be found at the um, AAC RERC um link that he provided in his handout so that you can follow the projects that he's a part of gail anything to add to david's i didn't know a lot about visual scenes before david's presentation and it's made me really curious about looking further into that um how they're using it and how, how i might be able to create some of my own visual scenes when i'm uh, working with students or teachers so. Well, if you're looking for a suggestion, you have right there in Oregon, um, Melly Fried Oaken, who looks at visual scenes very heavily for people with aphasia. Yeah. Um, I, I followed some of her research. 
and her presentations at the Isaac conference, because I had that, uh, my, that need for a person in my family. Um, and I had not known a lot about it before I attended those presentations that uh, she and her colleagues had done. Uh, I know Dr. Buchelman is doing some work, mostly focused on, again, individuals like David, you know, who are post-secondary, but uh, Janice Light, who is David's wife, works, looks at visual scenes at the other language end, at the beginning language stages. So looking at visual scenes, for very early emergent communicators. So yeah, that might be a good topic is visual scenes. Yeah, but sounds like yeah. we could do a whole year about it. Yeah, one of the things I've learned, you know, it was that never is never true and always is rarely always. So I just kind of put like my red flags up in that was first when you start thinking about something, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that. And then you hear all of these speakers and you're like, you know what? <laughs> I've got to give this a go. It might not have to be all the time, but it might be some of the time. And as Gail has put out here, I'm using my wrong clicker. You know, we've been, uh, thank you so much for um, Melanie and for Claire, for you sharing your um, input with Gail and I. And we also really want to know, um, you know, what you want. I think I've got a slide coming up. Remember, you can go back. Here's the link that takes you back to that s'mores list. Um, and then there's also, you know, the link from the ties conference. And I know that these aren't all recorded, but some of them are going to be available through recording. But the handouts are all available as well. And some of the folks like Jane Corsten and um, Aaron, Sheldon, and people that we've talked about already, Stephen, were, and Chris Gibbons, were all people that presented um, at the conference. So here we are. What else can you think of? What else is next? Sorry, back to the TICE conference, Gail, I wasn't able to attend. Is there a possibility to get a link so I could get some of the handouts? Um, you know, that's a question for Deb. If you have her email available, I would ask her. We did charge for the conference, and I'm not okay. sure what the uh, deal, okay. deal. I just is wanted Jenny Kaleg's uh, the new and standing. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I'm just not sure. Okay. Very good. All right, Gail. I'm going to turn it back to you. Well, we've got just a couple more minutes. Please unmute yourself and let's brainstorm about topics for next year. Um, I have, um, I actually wrote down that maybe we should invite Amanda Hartman to talk about her assistive wear videos. We want um, Chris Gibbons to come back and talk to us about coming back to school and, and the strategies for that now that he's given us an overview of uh, virtual school. We want Kelly back, of course. Um, oh, I was then, jumping off of something that Melanie said and thinking about, you know, having someone to champion OTs and PTs using AAC, uh -huh. you know. Let's get, we certainly have people like Gretchen Hanser out there as an OT, Karen Kangas as an OT that have done a lot in the field of AAC. And it might be, I think this is a nice crossover with ties of, you know, OTs and PTs also do AAC. <laughs> One of my coworkers who's an OT does a lot of the uh, assistive tech, which also leads into the AAC. And she's the one who's always fixing the, the um, iPads for the touch chat and a lot of the other activities. Great, yeah, that uh, that might be a really great session. Might be. Any other ideas before we go? Well, if I'm going to put my email in the chat box, and if you have any suggestions, um, please send them on. I know this is uh, kind of a, how about right now have a good idea thing. <laughs> but um, we are looking to get started on planning for next year's Echo Ties. Uh, no, Echo Voices and Echo Ties also. So 
join us in that planning. It's it's always best when we are developing sessions that work for you and ones that you want to know more about. And I want to thank you for your participation today. We had some great conversations and that was fun to do with you, Kelly. I had, uh, it felt like old times being- I know you didn't know I was going to pull you into the whole thing. <laughs> thank you, Kel Kelly. Thank you, Gail. Oh, thank, thank you, you, Melanie, for sharing. And Bye. thanks for being here. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, if we don't have any other comments, I'm going to go ahead and end this session and um, first stop recording.